Uh, God bless you and God keep you. Here we come from uh, the office uh, one more time and um, uh, due to safety, I wanted to take some time out to um, you know, remind God's people that God is still God and beside him uh, there is no other. And so with that being said, before we uh, truly get started, you all know I like to uh, start out with a bit of worship. So I'm doing a little bit of old school today. Just waiting on a few people to get in with me. I uh, just pray that uh, this word, this message, I would bless you. I would keep you. Uh, we're dealing with a lot right now in this season. So I just pray that uh, God's grace and favor will be upon you and keep you uh, in this in this season. So um, uh, we just pray, amen, for each and every one of you. All right, so I'm trying to get everything going here. Give me just a moment to make sure. I see a couple of people coming in here. I see a few people coming in. Amen, amen. Come on in here. God bless you. Come on in here. As we get ready to get started, I just want to play a little bit of this song. I just believe that it's pertinent to this uh, to this time um, and this season in that, man, we are dealing with a lot right now. We are just dealing with a lot. So here is a little bit of Bishop Morton to help us through this season. song you know father we stretch our hands to you uh, no other help we know and even in this season in this time we recognize and honor that god is still god he's still on the throne i do want to um touch uh basis on a few things but before i do so i want to pray so i ask you will pause for a moment and pray with me god we thank you today we thank you right now for your grace and your mercy Lord, we need you, and we need you in a special way. 
God, we're dealing with so many different things, so many different issues, so many places of division, so many places of hurt and pain. And God, you are able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Heal this nation, heal the community, and heal the church. God, I pray for those who have been uh, struck or hit, or homes that have been struck or hit with, with COVID-19. God, that you would touch their bodies, that you would ease pain. Lord, that you would reduce fevers. Oh God, in the name of Jesus, that you would open up airways for breath. God, we pray for hospitals. We pray for doctors and nurses who are caring for these uh, individuals as well. And God, that you would give us what we need in this season. God, we pray for the church. And we pray for the courage of leadership of the church, uh, for the wisdom and knowledge of the church. Lord, that we would do that which is according to thy will and according to thy loving care and tender mercy, but also with the knowledge that you've given each and every one of us. Lord, we just pray, God, that you would touch and continue to touch our elderly, our Mother Baldy, that you would touch, amen, Sister Alma, Lord, that you touch our Mother Lewis and, and Deacon Anderson and Sister Sue and all of those who uh, travailed through many years uh, to keep Wortham Chapel going. And God, we will always honor them and, and thank you for them. Now, Lord, as we move forward in this time, we pray that you would bless us and be with us. Lord, that your spirit would infuse us. Lord, that we would say what the spirit is saying to the church and that our ears would hear it and our hearts and our minds would receive it. In Jesus' name, I do pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank God for you. Thank God for you being on this morning. This is, uh, church, a, a challenging and difficult time uh, that we travail through and that we're dealing with. Um, as you know, I don't uh, particularly hide from and or shy away from issues and or things that are going on. Uh, so let me uh, address the issue in which uh, is uh, proverbial in our uh, media, social media uh, right now, and that is um, the decision by the Supreme Court to overturn um, litigation for over 50 years to uh, make uh, abortions illegal um, by law. And so uh, we do know that uh, this has caused or stirred up many different things. This is this is my take on it. As a gospel preacher, let me just go ahead and say that abortion is wrong. Okay. There's no hiding from that. There's no uh, escaping that. There's no uh, explaining away that abortion is not of God's will, not of God's plan. Now, I don't even have to quote uh, chapter, scripture, and verse to, to do such. But when it comes to the fact of unwanted pregnancy, is generally coming from a, a place of disobedience and that God uh, ordained uh, sex for marriage. And so when we have sex outside of such, that's when we have this issue of unwanted pregnancy. And with the unwanted pregnancy, then we have this issue of abortion. So we know that this is not of God. Do we know that this is not right according to uh, God's, uh, God's words? So, uh, and with that, and let me say this, because uh, many people really don't pay attention to political and polity and things of that nature. But this has been something that has been going on since uh, the Tea Party movement. This has been the goal of many conservatives and Republicans in this country. I am not at all surprised when, uh, as they are... Uh, elected Trump and, and then allowed the justices, three justices to be picked by such in that it will cause a total uh, shift in the makeup and history of our Supreme Court along with uh, the ability to have majority rule over decision making. Uh, let me say this. I'm also uh, one of those who say uh, very plainly and simply is that uh, just because you make it uh, illegal or or legal does not make it right to God. So I do struggle with this. I don't like, amen, the United States government 
trying to parade upon the flag of Christianity, which we are not a Christian nation and have not been and do not live and conduct ourselves as uh, a nation uh, of Christos in that we want to then make laws to outlaw things that are aligned with our beliefs. This is a very dangerous thing, church, in that uh, I am a true believer in separation of church and state in that Everyone who lives in this nation and this country do not align with our beliefs. And so therefore, I don't believe that laws should be erected that align specifically with what I believe in. And, and that when Jesus said uh, he named all the things he said, and against such, there is no law. And so when, we, when it comes to our self-conduct and our self-deprivation is that we have to make sure that we're living according to God's word individually and as a church and as a people and therefore would mitigate and or alleviate the fact of having a law in place uh, to eradicate something that is of the heart. See, when you have issues of the heart, sin, uh, amen, uh, abortion, racism, all of these other things that we have going on, these are issues of the heart and the soul. And only God and only Jesus can fix those. The law can't fix it, can't make it go away, can't do anything other than agitate. This is what we've gotten to now. As I've read my uh, timeline, if I've looked at many other media outlets and things of that nature, now more than ever, we have a, a greater divide of people who are either unwilling to or not, or, or are very disdained from hearing the Christian gospel because of how we've allowed people to derail and to uh, use Christianity to pervade a political uh, ideology and a really a supremist mindset, which is totally not of God. And so now you have people who hate the church and hate Christianity because of things that happen uh, like this week in overturning uh, this law. And so as a preacher of the gospel, you're kind of caught in such a ugly place in that, hey, Abortion is wrong, and I stand up and say that to anyone, right? It's not the plan of God. It's not how God designed it. He told us what to do and how to live and how to conduct ourselves. However, just the same as in Jesus' day, Jesus was not killed <laughs> by <laughs> a regime of, of these evil folks. No, he was killed by police officers, politicians, and religious leaders for preaching the gospel. And when he preached something or taught something that was different than what other people aligned with, they killed him. And we have to really take a time to look at history and understand that. So that's kind of, that's where I'm at. I'm in, I'm in a chasm in that I wanna preach the gospel, the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ and be willing to stand up on any platform and say what is wrong, what is right, according to the word of God. But yeah, I don't wanna be at a place in which the gospel is distorted to fit a political agenda or ideology that causes people to even disdain or hate the fact of the word Christianity. We have totally diluted the name of Christ in the name of a political agenda. And that's what I'm upset about in this whole thing. Um, uh, and, and I said it and I'll say it again, abortion is wrong. I, I'm not hiding from that. I'm not even uh, making any room for that. But what I am going to say is that when you live in a country where uh, there are so many different people, different ideologies, different everything, it's up to us as Christians to live the gospel. It's up to us to live according to the word of God. And so when we do that, when we live that, there's no need for a law to outlaw it. There's a need for a change of heart. There's a need for repentance. There's a need for change in the body or within the body of Christ. And so when we say that, I wanna make sure that I, that, I, that I had addressed and touched on that. Now the next thing, and I'm gonna to get to the word, the next thing is we're dealing with um, a spike in COVID-19. Currently we have a spike within the community. That's the reason why we're having a virtual service and not an in-person service. Um, and it was uh, basically born out of the idea of, of, of safety for all, because uh, really at this point, I've received so many phone calls of people who are either uh, quarantined or have tested positive that are members of the church, and we have no idea 
where it's coming from. So uh, as leadership, got with leadership and we decided that it would be best if we would, uh, you know, do this uh, virtually at this time so that we could, so that we can, um, you know, make sure that we give an opportunity for this to be cleared out. I'm very nervous and very concerned about the 4th of July holiday weekend in that I believe that it could, uh, at this point, uh, really, 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 really cause a, uh, a resurgence of, of COVID and if people aren't careful. So I'm asking for Worthen Chapel and all the members of, to be careful in this season and to uh, make certain that you uh, do everything you can to protect yourself. Don't be afraid to pull that, that mask out. You might have to put it in the washing machine and get it back clean and start back wearing that thing. Whatever you need to do to protect your family, do that in this season, all right? All right, so now, with that being said, um, we need God, church, like never before. And so I want to talk a little bit about God versus the gift. So turn with me to 2 Kings, the second chapter. 2 Kings, the second chapter. Amen. 2 Kings, the second chapter. Bless God. Hallelujah. And I'm going to start at verse 13. I'm going to read to verse 14. <clears throat> and the word of God says, He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord? God of Elijah. And when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that way. And Elijah crossed over. God bless us in this time. And we know that you will in Jesus name. Amen. God versus gift. God versus gift. God versus gift. So when we look at the text, that we have today, we notice that we have two characters and we have Elijah and we have Elisha. Now, Elijah was the uh, prevenient prophet of the time who had done many miracles, who had done many things uh, that were supernatural. Uh, he called down fire from heaven uh, and burned up the soldiers who would come to try and arrest him. He, he called down fire from heaven on Mount Carmel amen, to, to have a showdown with the, uh, the worshipers of Baal uh, in order to show that God is God and beside him there is none other. He, 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 he uh, outran horses. He did so many things that were just seemingly unbelievable. But Elijah was the prophet of God. The word prophet uh, comes from a Hebrew saying prophet, which means mouthpiece of God. He was the mouthpiece of God. The funny thing, though, is that uh, Elijah was a little more reclusive, and he was uh, what we would we would consider in this day and time. He was the uh, he was the opposite of an extrovert. He was an introvert, but yet he was called to a platform of national prolificity in that he had to speak what God told him to in a large crowd. Can you imagine that? Him being introverted, not really wanting to be around people, not really wanting to uh, be in the crowd, really not wanting to be in front of a lot of people, but yet God called him to do and say what he had for him to say. And this is a challenge, church, in that many times God calls us to do things that seem a bit uncomfortable. Oh yes, church, yeah. God just generally doesn't call us to comfort, but he calls us to discomfort. That's why God calls us to change and for us to do things that we normally would not do. And so we see that here we have on the precipice of Elijah is getting ready to leave. He knew that his time had come. It was time for him to go. Uh, the scripture even alludes to that he shared it with the sons of the prophets, which was the servants and or disciple of Elijah. Those that was learning from him, those that he was teaching, those that he was following, and even historical context says there were guilds of prophets, which means there were schools of prophets, which means they had a teacher and, and or a rabboni 
uh, one who was over them to teach them the word and the power of God. So Elijah was a leader, but there was a follower who was already anointed in Elisha. We have to make sure that we discern between the two. Now, Elisha, uh, if we read the historical context, was working in the field. He was leading a team of, of oxen and he was plowing his father's field. He was working. Hello, somebody. And while he was working, the Bible says Elijah walked up to him where he was plowing and put the mantle of God on him to let him know that this day, that this one day you would wear this mantle. And, and oftentimes God will show leadership who is the next leader in line for, for, the, for the office and for the opportunity to be what God has called you to be. And so Elisha was following Elijah. And the Bible says, that they came, uh, they was going down to Bethel, which is the house of bread. And, and Elijah looked at Elisha, he told him, he said, hey, hey, you stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha looked at Elijah and says, as long as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not lead you. I will not leave you, excuse me. And so they went down to Bethel together. Then the Bible says, after they went down to Bethel, said, that the sons of the prophets looked at Elisha and told him, he said, don't you know that the Lord is getting ready to take the master away? And Elisha says, yes, I know. Be quiet. Keep silent is what he says. In other words, don't talk about it. Just be quiet. And then Elijah said to Elisha again, he says, stay here, please, for the Lord is sending me to Jericho. And Elisha responds again, as long as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, I will not leave you. And so they went to Jericho. Notice now, church, in the text that we're looking at today, that, that he is consistent in following his leader, which is an appetite for uh, leadership, which is something that is, that is, is eroding away in the church today in that Everybody wants to be the leader or tell the leader what to do, yet they don't want to follow the leader. Notice that Elisha was a little bit different in that he said, as long as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. There is a spirit of abandonment in the church this day and this time and not a spirit of commitment. In other words, we have to commit that we're going to follow God, not only follow God, because sometimes we use that as a scapegoat, but follow who God sends. Oh my God. In that I understand that this person is not perfect. I understand that they don't do everything right, but as long as the Lord lives, oh my God, and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the Bible says they went on down to Jericho. When they got down to Jericho, the sons of the prophets came to Elisha again and said, don't you know, don't you know that, Eli that Elijah will be taken away from you today? He said, yes, I know. Keep silent. Mm. He says, so Elijah looked at him again and said, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan, to the Jordan River, to the place historically, where God showed the children of Israel that he is the God of Israel in the succession of leadership. Understand and know this, that when Moses had died, that they had mourned as a nation, the great prophet, the great pastor, the great leader in Moses, he, he had to leave because God had, 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 he had lived up to his, amen, his assignment, and it was time for him to go. Moses was called to lead them so far. And because of, of Moses being disobedient, he struck the rock instead of tapping the rock. It caused him to miss out on seeing Canaan. But the Bible declares and shows us that in the succession of Moses' leadership to Joshua, that God told Joshua, don't be afraid of their faces. Don't be afraid of them for I, the Lord thy God, and with thee, just like I was with Moses, which means I'm going to show the same favor, the same power on your behalf as I did on Moses. And when they got to the Jordan, the Bible says that the priests with the Ark of the Covenant, when they stepped in the water, as, as Joshua had instructed, that the rivers backed up. Now watch the text, church. Here we are again at the Jordan River. 
And Elijah said to Elisha, what are we going to do? What do you want to do? And he says, I'm going to follow you. And so when they got to the, to the Jordan River, the Bible says that Elijah, the prophet, took off his mantle, the thing that identified with him that God was with him, the mantle, which shows that he was carrying the anointing of God. Because if you notice in the Old Testament, there's style and type. There was things done uh, extraneously so that you could see them, so that you could understand who was with them. The mantle represented that God was with the prophet Elijah. The Bible says he rolled it up, struck the water, and the water was divided this way and that way. Blessed be the name of God. And the Bible says that they walked over on dry ground, him and Elisha. But the Bible says uh, in this part of the journey, this is where the sons of the prophet stopped because they had to stay on the other side of Jordan. Notice that only Elijah and Elisha could walk across the Jordan because God has something specifically for them. And it's something special, church, that when you follow God. And when you follow the one who God has sent, God will have something specifically special for you and cause you to walk into places that no one else, I don't hear anybody, has walked. Thanks be to God that we serve a God who rewards those who are committed. Now watch this church. So as they cross the Jordan on dry ground, somebody say miracle. See, God will show you a miracle to help you to understand that we serve a supernatural God. We oftentimes worry about natural things, natural issues, and natural situations, but we serve a supernatural God. And when we serve a supernatural God, it allows us to understand that though we are attacked naturally and though we are dealing with issues in our flesh and our finances or whatnot, we have to understand that we serve a God who can disrupt the natural order and do exactly what he said he would do. So here it is. They walk over on dry ground. Somebody ought to give God some praise because God is able to stop the waters that are blocking you. Oh, I didn't hear anybody shouting in this place. The thing that seems to keep you from getting to the other side, God has enough power, enough anointing on you in your mantle to cause the waters to stop for you to walk over on dry ground. But once they walked over on dry ground and he was committed to God and he was committed to who God sent, the prophet Elijah asked him, what is it that you want from me? What is it that you want from God. Here it is. Elisha says, give me a double portion of your spirit. Wow. A double portion. Not just a portion, but a double portion. And Elijah, being a humble and real leader, listen to his answer. You have asked a hard thing. So nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so for you, but if not, it shall not be so. Basically, what Elijah said is to Elisha, I have no control over what God will do. Uh-oh. Every good leader and every good person who is connected to and following and understand God understands this, that God makes the decision. We don't. Oh, my God. So watch this. He said, you are asking for something that I can't guarantee you or that I can't speak on because it does not belong to me. See, my anointing does not belong to me. My gifting does not belong to me. The things that God has enabled me to do does not belong to me. All the glory belongs to God. So if it's God, then it's God that I have to do it for you Oh. I didn't hear anybody. You have to understand, church, is that, is that when, when God gives you something, it is not for you. Most of the time, it's for his use, his kingdom, and for his glory. Here it is. After he said this, it's a hard thing. He said, but if you see me, when I'm taken away, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. So the answer's up to God. Here it is. This is going to happen as they continue on and, and they talk. And suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire separated 
the two of them. In other words, this was the only thing that separated Elisha from Elijah was the magnitude and the power of God in the form of a fiery chariot that he had to fall that he had to fall back because there are some places uh, that God has taken some people that you can't go because it's not your time. Here it is. Watch this. But the thing was, is understand, I want you to get this church, is he asked for a double portion of his spirit. Here's what we have in the church today that I want to deal with for a very short moment. We have a lot of people who are hungry for titles. Everybody want to be a bishop. Everybody want to be an apostle. You even have people who are going to get unaccredited degrees so that they can be called a doctor. And when you understand this, you have to understand people are hungry for the gift. They want the, the accolades. They want the, the ability. They want the, the shine and they want all of the, of the good things and the glory that comes with the gifting. But you have to understand, church, that if you get anything, you need to get the God. Oh, my Lord. Because if you get God, the gifts are, are available to you. Oh, here it is. Well, you understand. So Elisha asked for those things. And then there it is. As he's taken up in a, in a chariot of fire, horsemen of fire, the Bible says that the mantle fell from Elijah. You know why? Because Elijah didn't need the anointing where he was going. Because when you go to be with God, you're going to be with the anointing. So you don't need the anointing. Oh my God. Because God is the anointing. Uh -oh. When you understand the word uh, Christ, it means the anointed one of God. When you understand the messianic view of the text in which we're even reading right now is typified of Jesus in that when Jesus left and went to Calvary, but moreover, when he went to the grave and got up on the third day morning, when he was ascended into heaven, the Bible says that he said, I will send my comforter, my spirit, my paraclete, my helper, your lead, your guide, and your teacher in the Holy Spirit. Watch this. In that you, in that this things that I do, you shall do greater because I will be in you, not just with you. Somebody need to get that because the mantle, amen, was singular in that Elijah was the only one who could wear it or carry it during his time. But when it fell, Elisha was then able to pick it up. But when Jesus ascended to heaven, everyone could receive the mantle, the anointing, the power, the supernatural power of God. My God, I feel good this morning. And so when we think about this, Elijah and Elisha had this close relationship and Elijah is going on to be with the Lord. He left. He did not be buried. He was not put in the ground. There's a lot of mystery that surrounds that. But more importantly, this is what I want you to get, is that when the mantle fell, the Bible says that Elisha picked up Elijah's mantle. He picked up his assignment. He picked up his work. He picked up his responsibility. He picked up his commitment, not just the gift, but the God. Can I get it to you? Here it is, verse 14. He says, then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water. Woo, here it is, church. See, people want to be able to strike the water. People want to be able to, to, to have a Red Sea moment. People want to have those Elijah calling down fire moments. But this is the key to the moment. It's not about the gift. It's about the God. Oh, I don't hear anybody. Because we are hungry for gifts. We're hungry for titles, as I have said. We're hungry for money, hungry for power, hungry for political affiliation, hungry for all of these things. But are we hungry for the God who, who allows and or who has access to all of those things? And the Bible says that e Elisha said something that was so powerful that nobody, hardly anyone ever really recognized. He says, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Notice he didn't ask or call on the gifts of Elijah. He didn't talk about the anointing of Elijah, but he talked about the God of Elijah. He said, where is the Lord 
God of Elijah, what he was basically saying is that I, I can't do this unless I know that God is with me. I can't go anywhere unless God is with me. I can't do anything unless God is with me. I can't, I can't perform anything unless God is with me. So he called on God, not the gift. Oh, he leaned on God, not the gift. He, he, he was looking to God, not to the gift. And the Bible says, when he called on God and struck the water, that it was divided. Oh, somebody said, God will verify you. Mm, mm, mm. Because it's not about the gift that verifies you. It's about the God of the gift that will verify you. He had to do this, church, because on the other side of the water, I don't want you to forget this, all of the onlookers, the sons of the prophets, uh, all of the, the, the crowd was there, the, the, those who had followed Elijah and saw the miracles of Elijah would question the, the verity of Elisha. And you got to understand, church, there's always going to be people who will question uh, your, your reality, who will question your assignment, who will question whether God has, has called you to do this thing, you'll always have that. But that's why God will bring you to the Jordan. Because when he brings you to the Jordan, to a place in which people can see God miracle working on your behalf, watch this. When he struck the water, the water was divided. And the only reason why God did that, because God does not have to prove himself to anybody, God is God, whether we believe him or not, whether we trust him or not, he's God. But but he did this for us. He struck the water, the water departed because he wanted them to see the sons of the prophets. He wanted witnesses. He wanted somebody to be there so that they could say, I saw it with my own eyes that when he struck the water, it parted just like he did when Elijah hit it and they went across. He did the same thing for Elisha when he came back. Oh my God. The Bible says that you will be blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed going in and blessed coming out. And thanks be to God that it's not about the gift, but it's about the God of the gift. And in this time, church, let us not look for the titles. Let us not look for the political affiliation. Let us not look for the gifting. Yes, we love to hear good singing. Yes, we love to hear great musicians. Yes, we love to hear great preaching and, and great hooping and all of these things. But if we have all of that and we don't have God, we don't have anything. Search, look, and long for the God, not the gift. Church, we're in a very difficult impasse and we need the God of Elijah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that rose Jesus from the dead to show up like never before. We're so divided, so full of hate, and it's not just those who proclaim to not be Christian, but it's even those who proclaim to be Christian who are full of hate by their examples. The Bible says, out of the mouth speaks the abundance of the heart. So if hate comes out of your mouth, then there has to be hate in your heart according to the word of God. And when we seek the gift, same thing happened in the days of Paul, in that when they saw Paul do miracles, a man came to him offering them money to Peter and Paul and all the apostles for the gift, for the power to do these miracles. But what he didn't understand is you can't buy God because God already owns everything. And when we understand that we are his servants and that when we serve him, that when we get to our Jordan, he has the anointing to get us across it. Mother Marty used to say, God bless him. If God bring you to it, God can bring you through it. So let's look for God. Let's search for God. Let's have a hunger for God and God's word and God's spirit and not a hunger for titles, for gifting, or for pomp and circumstance. 
Let us get hungry for God. And even in this time and in this season, whether you agree or disagree with what's going on, I'm looking to God. I'm not looking to the politicians because they're all crooked and evil. I'm not looking to the Supreme Court because for years they upheld a constitution that said that I was uh, three-fifths of a man and I wasn't even human. So I'm not looking to institutions or to written documents that was written by men, but I'm looking to my Father in heaven. I'm not looking to the president. I appreciate whoever is in that office. I appreciate the senators and the congressmen and women, but I'm not trusting in them. I'm looking to God. Because if anybody brings us out, it's going to be God. But the only way we're going to be brought out is if we repent. There are some things that we need to turn from. And it doesn't matter what we do with legal versus illegal. Murder is wrong to God. <laughs> doesn't matter if it's if you hide behind stand your ground laws, Second Amendment rights, doesn't matter. It's wrong to God. Whether you wear a badge or don't wear a badge, it's wrong to God. So when we take assessment of the complexities that we're dealing with in this world and it's time right now, we need God. That's the simple answer. We need God. God bless us and God keep us and lead us and guide us through this time. I'm praying for you and I hope you're praying for me. I'm saddened that we have to uh, do this virtually from my office today. Anybody that knows me know I love church. I want to be at church. I, I love worship and I love God. And I, uh, that if there was a, a, a better way, I would. This is that's what we would have done. But I also understand that part of my calling is to protect and keep the sheep safe, and that's what I'm doing at this time. Do I get everything right? Absolutely not. Am I wrong sometimes? Absolutely. But I solicit your prayer and your support in that I'm human just like you. I'm dealing with issues just like each and every one of you. I, I haven't walked on water <laughs> and I haven't parted any Red Seas and I haven't called down any fire. And even those who did some of that still had to deal with things that they was fighting with in their flesh. I want to implore church, you this, is to support those in leadership and pray for those in leadership. Many leaders are hurting in ways that you wouldn't imagine and dealing with things that you have no clue about. And oftentimes get attacked for things that they either don't know or really didn't have a full understanding of. Pray for your leaders. There's many people who would prevail and say that the those the propitioners of the pulpit will use it as a platform to attack people personally. But I also wonder do we consider those who attack the pulpit but don't know their pastor or their leader personally. We need each other in this time and in this season. The devil comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. And he does it by separating us, by utilizing ideologies and things of that nature to cause us to degradate each other and to dehumanize each other. But if we can get a hold of God and get to a place in which we can hear and love as God has loved us, then we can get to a place in which God will move on our behalf. God bless you.
God keep each and every one of you. I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Till the next time. God bless you and peace.